Welcome to Worship Trends for the 2020s, Part 2. Now, before we proceed with this session, I just want to suggest that you go back to Part 1. Find it on my YouTube channel. Uh, very quickly, here's what we did in, in uh, Worship Trends, Part 1. We talked about the worship of the past 60 years. I talked about worship in the 60s and the 70s and the 80s and the 90s and the 2000s. Uh, back in 1986, I wrote a book called Exploring Worship. Uh, and I've been tracking with the worship movement for decades now. This book has gone around the world. I think it's still one of the best equipping tools available to the worshiping community today. And I think it's important that we understand where we've come from so that we can understand where we are. And when we understand where we are, then we can move forward where God's taking us. And so I'd like to ask that question now. Uh, we're going to go to some new content now in part two session here. And I want to ask the question, where is God taking us? Now, I'm not going to pretend that I know the full answer to that. In fact, I just have a tiny fraction of the answer in this session, but there are many others in the body of Christ that are going to round this out and complete it. I'm just going to try to be faithful to give my part of the puzzle as I uh, participate in this discussion. So, I want to start by saying I celebrate today's worship trends. Here's what I see today. We have more music musicians, anointed, skilled musicians in the church today than ever. We've got some of the best songwriters of history in the church today, and I give Hillsong a lot of credit for that. We've got passionate, expressive worship teams in literally every denomination, every nation around the world. Almost any church you go to today, you're going to have a passionate spirit-filled worship team. We've got musical excellence in the church today. We have powerful quality equipment. And my goodness, we've got to talk about the 24-7 prayer and worship movement that has exploded in the last 20 years around the world. It's just fantastic what God is doing in the worshiping uh, community in what I call the worship movement. What God is doing today is wonderful. It's awesome. And I'm celebrating it. Now, what I see coming in the 2020s, I see an explosion of creativity. I see the creatives being mobilized. I see an explosion of film and media. YouTube is just starting. I see the corporate singing of scripture. Right now we have worship teams singing scripture, but I see entire congregations doing Colossians 3.16, which says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. That scripture is going to be fulfilled in the 2020s, I believe, as the body of Christ will be equipped to sing scripture to the Lord and with one another. I see songs, indigenous songs, from every nation of the earth being used internationally. I'm seeing songs written in China that are going to go around the world. Songs written in India that are going to go around the world. Songs written in Russia, in Brazil, in Colombia, in the Netherlands. They're going to go around the world because I see the church in the 2020s singing the songs of the nations. And in the 2020s, I see a resurgence of the song of the people. Now, that's the thing that I want to expand upon in this session. I'm going to break it down a little bit. What do I mean, the song of the people? Well, to explain it, I need to just identify where I think we're at right now in the body of Christ. Where the church is at, and now I am saying this in a broad strokes over generalization, because there are exceptions everywhere to this. But I'm painting a broad stroke now to say that in the 2020s, for the most part, generally 
Biblically speaking, our churches do four songs on a, in a Sunday set service set list. It's kind of like the 1960s all over again. We have uh, uh, we've got four songs, and Sunday worship is something like a YouTube playlist. We've got excellent music, excellent lyrics, lots of passion, high energy, cool atmosphere. And here's what our services are looking like right now. We sing the first song, and when we have finished with the first song, then we get into the second song. Once we have sung song number two, then we sing song number three. After we have finished song number three, then we sing song number four. When song number four is finished, then we move on to other things like the offering and the sermon and whatever other things we might have to fit into that particular service. And it's almost like a YouTube track. We've got song one, song two, song three, song four, almost like a YouTube track. And I'm going, you know what? I could have gotten that service on a YouTube playlist. Track one, track two, track three, track four. And there's really not a lot of difference between Sunday morning worship in many churches and a YouTube playlist. We're back in the 1960s when every church was doing four songs. Back in the 60s, we were doing four hymns. Now in the 2020s, we're doing the top YouTube songs, which I love. YouTube has made the songs universal around the world. I love that. But you go to a church today in the 2020s, and you're probably going to get four songs. One, two, three, four. You know it's playlist worship. When the people People in the room are having the same experience as the people watching on the live stream. There is something about corporate worship that is to be experienced in the room that when people watch it on the live web stream, you're like, I'm sorry you missed it. You should have been there because corporate worship in what God intends for it is something that is vital and organic and real in the moment. Why are we back in a 1960s model of worship? And here's my analysis on it. We have not brought with us the tools that God equipped us with in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. God gave us some very specific tools for worship back in the 70s, 80s, and 90s that were expressed primarily through the charismatic side of the body of Christ. As I said in the first session, in the 70s, the sustained one chord. But here's the thing. It was the song of the people. Everyone would lift their voices in their own song to the Lord. And in the 70s, they were equipped to sing their own song to the Lord. And then in the 80s and 90s, when the Lord equipped us with chord progression so that now the, there was rhythm and there were melodies melodic movements and chord movements that would happen along with that free worship. The Lord gave that to us in the 80s and 90s. And now in the 2020s, many of us have forgotten and lost these tools that God gave us back in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. And I just have a very simple call in this session to the body of Christ. I'm just saying, let's go back and pick up the tools God gave us in the 1970s, 1980s, 1990s. That sustained one chord. The, the, the free worship on those chord progressions. Let's go back 
back, recover those gifts, and take them forward with us. Today, we are singing the songs of the songwriters. We are singing the songs of the platforms. We are singing the songs of the worship bands. But we have lost the song of the people. When the song is over, the worship is over. And when the platform finishes their song, the people have no more song to sing. They haven't learned how to worship past the song. And this is what I see for the 2020s. God is going to help us to pick up the tools from the 70s, 80s, 90s and bring them into the 2020s and release the song of the people. Now, I'm going to use as an illustration, this is almost an over-exaggeration because I'm going to use as an example some of the extreme uh, uh, that's in the body of Christ. This is extreme now. Uh, certainly not uh, not everyone, but there are some churches that you can go to today. Here's what it looks like. People come into the lobby. They grab a latte or they grab some kind of coffee, whatever their choice. They bring it into the sanctuary, and then the worship team explodes on the platform. There's passion. There's lights. There's energy. They're zeal. They're prayed up. They're prepared. They are passionate for Jesus. And you've got this explosion of fire and worship on the platform. And the congregation stands in the sanctuary, sipping on their lattes and enjoying the bonfire on the platform. Almost like people gathered around a fireplace and warming their hands to the glow that comes off the fireplace. And no, don't get me wrong. The congregation loves it. They're enjoying the passion of our platforms. They're enjoying the zeal and the fire and the worship that's coming from our worship bands. And they're warming themselves at the cozy fire of the bonfire that's burning on the platform and sipping on their lattes. When David brought the ark into Jerusalem, you may recall the story, it says that Michael was watching from the window while David was worshiping. Michael watched, David worshiped. And we have the same dynamic happening still today. Every worship service has its watchers and its worshipers. Now, I love it when we have a lot of watchers in a worship service, because what that tells me is we've got people coming to our churches that are coming to check this out. They're coming to see, hey, what's going on here? What are they doing? And what's their message? And I want many watchers to come and just watch what we're doing. I love that. But once you become a believer, once you become a disciple of Jesus Christ, I want you to transition from being a watcher to being a worshiper. And this is what worship, worship ministries are all about. This is our mandate. We're trying to cultivate disciples of Christ to become worshipers of Jesus. We're not just trying to build a bonfire for 30 minutes on a Sunday morning. We're trying to awake, awaken the bride of Christ to become worshipers 24-7. And we are in the process of wanting more and more watchers to become worshipers that abandon themselves in love to Jesus Christ. The goal of our worship ministries is not to make a bonfire on the platform. The goal of our worship ministries is to start a forest fire in the congregation. We start a bonfire on the platform because we want to ignite a forest fire among God's people. We're wanting to awaken and turn watchers into worshipers. And I'm asking God to do this in the 2020s and awaken the song of the people 
so that even as it says in Revelation 5, every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth is lifting their voice in adoration to the Lamb of God. May every voice be lifted in praise to God. Jesus, we've seen your cross. We've seen who you are. Lamb of God, we lift our voices together to glorify and praise the name of Jesus. I want to be very clear. Corporate worship is not a playlist. It's a journey. There's a sense of launch, there's a sense of journey, and there's a sense of completion. Worship leaders are shepherds. We are shepherding the flock. We're not called to pull off successful worship sets. We're called to lead people to Jesus Christ until Psalm 84. Each one appears before God in Zion. We are going somewhere together. When the service launches Sunday 10 a.m. or whatever the time, when that service launches, we are finding a corporate identity. We are launching on a journey together. And by the time that worship service is complete, we have moved together into the heart of God. Corporate worship is a journey. And the real worship leader is the Holy Spirit. All the metaphors for the Holy Spirit are fluid. In Scripture, he's called water, oil, breath, wind. All of the metaphors for the Holy Spirit are fluid. There is nothing digital about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not a click track. Now, don't get me wrong. I love click tracks. I love how they keep us on tempo. But the Holy Spirit is not a click track. The Holy Spirit is very fluid in his movements. And when we make the Holy Spirit our worship leader, we now surrender to the fluidity of his movements in the congregation. And I just want to say to worship leaders around the world, Don't limit the Holy Spirit to a playlist. Don't limit the Holy Spirit to your set list. He's bigger than a set list. Don't tether the breath of heaven to a playlist. Let's honor the Holy Spirit because true worship breathes and moves and is fluid. It's reciprocal. It's conversational. The worshipers of the world have a message for the worship leaders of the world. And here's what we want to say. We didn't come to this service for your set list. We came to follow the breath of the Holy Spirit. We came for a fluid flowing in the oil of the anointed Holy Spirit. We have come for something that's living, an organic tapestry, something that carries a nuance. There's ebb and flow. There's spontaneity. It's raw. It's visceral. It's symphonic. It's breathing. Corporate worship must move past playlists in 2020. This is my vision for the 2020s. God, take us past playlist worship. I celebrate what has brought us to this moment. I love it. Let's just keep moving forward in the grace of God. Let's unlock the song of the people. Every wave of revival that God has brought to our planet, if you become a student of revival, read the books on revivals, the revivals of the past, 
the John Wesley revival, almost any revival of church history that you study will have this common denominator in them. A resurrection of the song of the people. Jesus, would you move by your Holy Spirit in a tsunami of glory, awaken your church, and give us again the song of the people in the 2020s. I was in California uh, a couple years ago. I was in Orange County, a lovely community called Dana Point. It's gorgeous there. And my host took me to lunch at a uh, a Carlton Ritz, uh, a Ritz-Carlton Hotel. We're in this hotel. We're on the bluff overlooking the ocean. And the one wall of the restaurant is total glass. I'm sitting with two pastors, my hosts, and we're having lunch. And we're overlooking the ocean. And there's people out there surfing. And we're having this beautiful conversation. And in the course of our conversation, I learned that both of my hosts, these two pastors, both of them were surfers. And I'm like, oh my goodness, I'm going to take advantage of this opportunity because worship leaders are surfers. I've had this fascination with surfing all my life because this is just what we do. We are surfers. And so I'm like, I'm going to pull their chain. I want to find out, okay, what is surfing all about? So I'm trying to drill down on it with them. Like, talk to me about surfing. What is the deal with surfing? Because I've never actually surfed in the ocean before. And so they're telling me what happens. They said, you get out into the water. And then they said, you're looking for that big wave. And they said, waves come in groups. I did not know this. Waves come in groups. They said, yeah, there's maybe 13, 15 waves in a group. And they said that it's the middle wave that's the big one. So you want to identify that big one. And then once you've identified, okay, this is the big wave in the group, your next question is, am I positioned to capture it? Because they said, in order to ride that wave, you have to be in the sweet spot. And I'm going, sweet spot? They said, yeah, waves have sweet spots. If you're this, if you're a few feet this side of the sweet spot, or a few feet this side of the sweet spot, you may as well just let that wave go right past you because you're not positioned in the sweet spot to take that wave all the way in. And I'm going, you've just explained my life to me. I have witnessed movements of the Holy Spirit where waves of the Holy Spirit have come through the church. It was a big one. I wanted to catch it, but I wasn't positioned in the sweet spot. Because of where God had me in my season, it was a wave my brother was able to catch. And so I'm watching my brother surf that wave all the way to the shore. And I had to let it go by. And it's like the Lord says, yeah, that wave wasn't for you. It was for me. It was of my spirit. It just wasn't for you. You're going to have to wait a little way, a little while until I send another wave because there's another big one coming that'll be for you. So surfers, they're trying to identify the, the right wave. And then they're asking themselves, can I get, can I swim to the sweet spot and capture the sweet spot of that wave and then take it off? all the way into the shore. They said two things about surfing to me that were so profound for me that I actually wrote them down. They said this, you don't learn anything about surfing until you get in the water. They said you can read, you can watch all those YouTube tutorials, but until you get in the water, they said, you don't know anything about surfing because you're going to learn surfing by doing it wrong a hundred times over and over again, thousands of times before you'll master the thing of surfing. And I'm like, oh, 
okay, well, that's what worship leading is all about, is getting out in the ocean and then blowing it time after time after time. And we learn how to lead worship by getting in the water. And then the next thing they said to me was this, when you're in the water, you learn to read the ocean. I said, what did you just say? They said, you'll learn to read the ocean. Wow. In surfing, you're learning to read the ocean, to identify the right wave, and to decide, am I positioned to catch it? Worship leaders, learn to read the ocean. When you get in worship, learn to read the movements of the Holy Spirit. Identify his waves. Spot the movements of the Holy Spirit. Capture the right wave and then take it all the way to the shore. We don't need digital worship and click track worship and set list worship. We need surfers that have learned to read the ocean and can take it all the way to the shore. So now I want to conclude this Worship Trends for the 2020s, Part 2. I want to conclude with one final word to worship leaders. My scripture is Romans 1, verse 9. For God is my witness, Paul said, whom I serve with my spirit in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I make mention of you always in my prayers. Paul says in Romans 1, verse 9, he said, I serve God with my spirit. Now, Paul was an exceptionally gifted man. He was very talented. I would call him a five-talent guy. Everything he touched, he was just very capable at. He had stuff burning on all the burners, if you know what I'm saying. And Paul did not say, I serve God with my gifts. I serve God with my talents. I serve God with my strengths and with my abilities. Paul said, I serve God with my spirit. Now, we cultivate our gifts. We maximize our talents. We do everything we can to maximize the gifts and talents that God has given us. But to be effective in worship, you must go beyond your gifts and talents. You must serve God. God with your spirit. Musicians and worship leaders are some of the most gifted people in the body of Christ. And here's the problem or the temptation of gifted people. We have a temptation to lean on our giftings and rely on our talents. If you're gifted enough, you can pull off a successful worship service and hardly even have to lean on the Holy Spirit in desperate dependence. But there is a dimension in leading worship that goes beyond giftings and talents. It's serving God with our spirit. The spirit of a person. I don't know if the camera can capture this, but it's not here. Our spirit does not function from here. Our spirit does not function from our heart. Our spirit functions from down here somewhere in the belly area where Jesus said out of our belly would flow rivers of living water. The seat of the human spirit is somewhere in this vicinity. And if we are to lead worship effectively, read the ocean, move with the fluidity of the Holy Spirit, and unlock the song of the people, we must learn how to lead worship with our spirit. And I'm saying to every worship leader, 
lead worship from here. I'm saying to every guitar player, play your guitar from here. I'm saying to every keyboard player, play the keys from here. I'm saying to every singer, sing from here. I'm saying to every drummer, play drums from here. Learn to serve God with your spirit. You will learn to read the ocean of the movements of the Holy Spirit. You will be equipped to unlock the song of the people and the praises of the Lamb will explode around the earth as now not just our platforms singing the songs of the Lamb, not just our worship bands, but the people of God no longer simply watching, but now worshiping, because we've learned to serve God with our spirit. Lord Jesus, I'm asking, in the 2020s, would you unlock the creatives? Would you unlock the, the film in this, in this decade? Would you equip us to sing scripture in congregations? Would you move us past playlist worship that we might unlock the song of the people? Teach us how to read the ocean of the movements of the Holy Spirit and to serve you, Jesus, with our spirit so that we might unlock the song of the people in the 2020s. Bride of Christ. Let your voice arise. The Lamb is worthy.